Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the 2022 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Jen Whaley, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel today, Birdies and Big Data, the Golf Revolution. Our panelists today are Chief Commercial Officer for the PGA of America, Jeff Price, President and CEO of the Acousnet Company, David Marr, SVP of Golf Technology for the PGA Tour, Ken Lovell, and our panel will be moderated by Susie Whaley, Honorary President for the PGA of America, and my mom. <laughs> <laughs> the panel will run for 45 minutes. We'll leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. So please submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag birdies and big data. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, mom. That's my girl. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. We're thrilled to see there's this many golfers in the room. At least I hope that you're all golfers, because that's certainly my passion and my purpose. But what we hope to have with you today is a really cool conversation around the sport of golf. Uh, we are in an incredible moment in time in golf. We're a $90 billion industry uh, that's escalating as we speak. 800,000 new golfers uh, just during the pandemic alone. Uh, many of whom are women and juniors, which we're really excited about. So we hope to give you some data points. Obviously, this is big data. Um, we like to make lots of birdies. Well, I talked to these guys earlier. I've got to help them out with that a little bit. Um, we're going to make more birdies, uh, but we're going to showcase to you uh, what we're currently doing in the game of golf, which is a really traditional game at its roots. Um, and people think it's just a sport. It's 18 holes. You walk around. You hit a little white ball. You try to get in the hole. and you know, it's been told that many times people think it's boring, which was long ago. We're going to showcase to you how we're changing that mindset and how we're using data, stats, analytics, um, and a whole lot of fun for those of you who've never played. Um, we want to entice you to the game through some of those analytics. But it's also shaping the way you view golf. It's shaping your way, uh, the way you are a fan. It's shaping the way you're playing golf every day. And it's certainly shaping the way some of you are probably betting on our sport. So uh, let's get started. Uh, you know, you've already been introduced, gentlemen, but I, I want to give you a quick uh, kind of a reset on, on who we are, um, which is often confused in the golf landscape. So the PGA Tour is an entity that's separate of the PGA of America. The PGA Tour is what you see week in and week out on television. Uh, it's the leading tour in the United States of America for the best golfers in the world. The PGA of America is the industry side of that. We are the largest sports association in the world. We have 29,000 members that are in the industry of the game, uh, as well as PGA Tour players, LPGA Tour players, are members of the PGA of America. So it gets very confusing because the PGA of America runs the Ryder Cup. We have the PGA Championship. We have the KitchenAid Women's PGA Championship and the KitchenAid KPMG Women's PGA Championship and the KitchenAid Senior PGA Championship are entities of the PGA of America, um, which makes it confusing uh, to the consumer landscape. Uh, typically, we, Jeff and I get the question all the time, oh, you're the PGA Tour. Um, no, we're not the PGA Tour, uh, both 501c3s and 501c6s, but very different organizations. And then, of course, uh, David is here representing the global leader, um, one of the global leaders in brands in manufacturing and distribution uh, of product worldwide, being part of a Kushnet. Um, so just, just a level set on, on who we are and what we do. So no longer do you have to confuse the PGA Tour and the PGA of America, um, even though we both are in the same uh, space uh, in the global marketplace. So gentlemen, uh, really, I'm going to throw this out to all three of you to start. Um, we'll kind of start from the past here. And Jeff, I'll start with you. You know, what have you seen change over the last 20 years beyond this COVID period of huge growth in the game um, when it comes to the sport of golf? So, Susie, so I'm going to start with kind of macro data. For probably 18 of the last 20 years, the NGF measured golfers by, did you play on a green grass facility? So there were about 25 million or so over that time frame that played. The most recent data, which I think is really interesting, is actually there's 37 and a half million golfers in the United States. 12 only play on green grass. 12 play green grass and are engaged in off-course activities, and another 12-5 who are doing kind of innovative experiences, either in experiential golf activities, driving ranges, simulators. So the game has changed significantly, and much of that is because the game historically kind of followed sun up to sundown, and the opportunity to play was within those windows. If you think about the innovation that's come, if you're in that simulator, um, back that we're here. Please, everybody go and take a swing um, with our friends from About Golf. But ultimately, 
you can play at night, you could play at five in the morning. And so opportunities to meet consumers where they want to engage on our sport versus only being able to follow sun up to sundown, I think has been a pretty dr dramatic change in how our sport embraces consumers, invites everyone to play the mm -hmm. game, and makes it something that is a sport for everybody. Yeah, really redefining what golf is. It doesn't have to be 18 holes. Correct. Right? It can be an experience at a top golf, and it can be gamification of the game sitting in your house. David, how about you? Uh, where, where do you see it in the manufacturing space over the course of the last 20 years? What's the yeah, change? Yeah, thanks, Susie. Uh, so I, I tend to look at it through the lens of what's going to prompt or entice golfers to play more golf or newcomers to enter the game. And, and if you think back over the past 20 years, the, the, the true diving, the, the, tr the two driving forces there are, it's a hard game, so instruction is critically important. And I think uh, what's changed is you have better instruction and much more accessible instruction. So think about your phone. Right now you can, you can pull up lessons um, on any topic and it's free and it's readily accessible. It's incredibly well done. So one of the barriers to the game had been it's hard to play. So more instruction, better instruction is really important over the last 20 years. The other side of it, a bit closer to home, is customization in that we can now put equipment in golfers' hands that's made to order for them. And, and, and you know, to generalize, uh, 20 years ago, roughly 15% um, roughly of our product was custom fit to you, the golfer. Today, it's closer to 75, 85% of what we make is custom fit for you, the golfer. So that's another, that's another action that's gonna help you play better. And I know if you're gonna play better, chances are you're gonna play more and you're gonna, just, you're gonna stay with the game a whole lot longer. And that's a driving force to how the industry can and will grow in, in, in the future. And, and then maybe a sidebar to that is, you know, the game, the game sometimes battles um, great traditions. It's, it's a wonderfully traditional game with tomorrow and technology. And I think back over time, some of those, some of those conflicts between tradition and technology that, that manifest themselves in golf. And I do think golf's figured out a way to say, hey, there are people who like to play the game as an escape. There are people who like to play the game for its wellness benefits, for its exercise benefits, for its social, for its competitive, and they want to get as far away from their phones and technology as they possibly can for two, three, four hours. Yet there's a new wave of participants who thinks about it quite differently that said, no, no way I'm leaving my phone, and no way I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave technology or data collection um, in my car when I go play the game. So years ago, that was a conflict in the game, and I think that it's much more harmonious in terms of how the industry thinks about and welcomes both sides of that tradition and technology um, opportunity. Yeah, and I, I will definitely dig into that a little bit more as we talk about how we're defining those demographics and how we're targeting them uh, each in a different way for the three of you. Um, Ken, how about you? I, I know it's a really hard question for you, and we're going to dig into a lot of this, but you know, just stay in that last 20 years and kind of what you think is the most, the thing that's the most different about the tour. Well, it's, well I think that the thing that is interesting that's changed, well, let's start with the obvious. Tiger Woods drove interest to levels. Anyone that is getting good, as good at one thing as he is at one thing is fascinating to watch, which is a lot of why a lot of us are here. That drove interest, and that interest developed a lot of uh, opportunities. And by that, what I'm saying is there's a lot of, uh, the, the number of players that are now in the game um, that are very, very good is insane. Uh, there is a lot of talent, and it's growing very, very quickly. What that has led to is the ability to invest in ways for more and more people to consume the sport. Um, they can watch, they can see, they can find things out. So it's interesting, you made the point that golf was a sun up to sun down kind of exercise. Somebody's playing golf somewhere globally in a really cool way all the time. So I'm, I joke a lot, a lot of the time, um, I'm, my biggest interest for all of you is to make the PGA Tour the single biggest detriment to U.S. productivity on Thursday and Friday that could possibly exist. <laughs> I, all I ask for is, I used to say 10 hours a week, um, you know, start to finish. The truth is we have a, an amazing advantage over all the other sports in that we still haven't even covered the entire playing field. There is golf going on that no one sees. That's going to change very quickly and is now. Um, but we have that opportunity, and that has translated into a global phenomenon. So I'll, I'll tell a brief story that happened just this morning. Um, a friend of mine named Mike Vitti is a guy who has written for PGATour.com. He now handles all of, I worked with him for 15 years in various ways. He and I have worked on a lot of this kind of stuff for a long time. Um, he wrote an article a long time ago for PGATour.com, I mean 15 years ago, uh, about 
um, just about it was a data story. And uh, it, for some reason, was picked up traffic-wise and, and was very big in Norway, and no one knew why. Ironically, today, he is taking his, uh, his daughter on a trip and literally flew to Norway this morning, just uh, as on a, you know, between uh, college years kind of thing. And he got on a train, and there was a kid with golf clubs. Um, and so he started talking to the guy. And the guy not only is following Victor Hovland, who, by the way, is leading the tournament today and shot an amazing round yesterday, um, but knew who Mike was. Um, which tells you, like, that. talk about full circle, that's an amazing level of people being able to consume things in ways that you just never would have seen. So that kind of growth is insane. You know, I'm going I'm to stay with you for a second as we think about data collection and what the tour is using that data collection for. You know, we have player improvement. You talked about that. Um, we have course layouts, fan loyalty, experience, sponsorship sales. I mean, there's so many caveats to what you could be tracking on the PGA Tour. What, what are the most... What, where are your priorities uh, for the tour? What, what are you looking at? What, what statistics uh, are you managing day in and day out? All of them. Um, <laughs> so I look at this in a pretty simple way. I'm, we have an objective with ShotLink to measure the ball where it is in motion at every second all the time. Uh, if, if we do our jobs right, and when I say that, I mean this will be an ongoing development problem. Anyone who says they measure everything is selling something. Um, but we're working on it. We're going to get better at it. Um, but I want to know everything about every golf course all the time. Um, where is the ball? There will never be a lost ball on the PGA Tour if we get our way, right? Because you simply will know where the ball is all the time. You can model it, you can find it, you can figure it out, you can measure it, you can track it, uh, and put sensors all over the place to find it. So to me, it is really getting down to that most granular level. What is the smallest molecule that you can find? And from that, everything else is derivative. You can, I mean, greens and regulation is the derivative of just knowing a coordinate from where the ball is. Where would it start? Where did it end? And that all starts with, I mean, we're mapping every golf course now down to the centimeter, down to the tree branch, down to the leaf, so we know where everything is, and we can then put things in relation to those points. Once we have that, we can, we can learn anything you want, and frankly, the more you open that up to people to think about it, you get interesting measures for performance that we haven't even considered yet. That's, that's the objective. It's not David's. He doesn't want every golf ball found. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But <laughs> it's all good, David. But we're happy to hear about that, Ken. Um, that's not that going the into PGA the consumer tour? game. That's going into the tour game. So keep purchasing your golf balls. Um, you know, as we look at that, David, and, um, you know, you have this great stat that I love. Uh, since 1949, you've been the number one ball uh, in the game. But when you think about the data that the tour collects and shares with you about that, you know, what, what is the consumer side for you? Because that's obviously your manufacturing and distribution uh, priority. And, and how are you doing that in this landscape now to ensure you're giving each consumer um, insights into their own game? How, how are you managing that? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question we live with um, real time. Um, the tour piece is, is quite simple, right? The, the name of the game on tour is um, we want our athletes to play their, their very best. And, and our agreement with our athletes will give you the best product and service to help you play your, your very best. And we use ShotLink data. We use all the information available to us to help them play better. And what you may notice is ShotLink may say, hey, over the last three weeks, more of your misses are left, okay, maybe we can change that with a lie angle or a shaft change. So that, that's the tour side. Um, the, the, the broader piece for us is, is the consumer market, which, which pays the bills, um, and, and really four buckets for data. Product development, broad, broad product development, customization, communication, and, and then the, the, the one I may not get to, business analytics, but, but product development. A um, good example would be we collect uh, our ball team, our ball R&D team, um, collects about 75 million data points a year in the development process. We collect it from prototypes, we collect it from our products, we collect it from competitive products, and, and, and we collect it from um, all the interaction we do. We have science vans, we have fitting vans around the country interacting with golfers all the time. So we're hitting shot after shot after shot, all that data comes back. Um, and, and really two, two angles for that would be the, the big data piece is you put it on a board and you see all the mapping of all the consumers and you say, okay, uh, one of our balls, Pro V1, covers that group nicely. One of our balls, Pro V1X, covers that group nicely. What about this group over here? Um, and in that case, you discover there may be an opportunity for a new product. So we introduced a ball called AVX. 
lower spin, lower compression, lower flight for some golfers. It's just a really good solution. So that's sort of the, the big data piece and what we do with it from a product development standpoint. That same, that same logic happens on clubs, it happens in footwear, it happens in, in, in all, all of our businesses. The other piece, and, and we're not as far downfield as we'd like for a lot of different reasons, but I think this is the, the path we're going, is I talked about the big data view. What's really compelling to us is knowing each one of you and how you hit a ball and what your characteristics are and what products and features and attributes you'd benefit from. So we're, we're all round up and say we're just okay at that right now. And a lot of it is how we collect the, how we collect the data what we do with it, what our rights are, privacy rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's the big product development piece. The holy grail is really going to be customization. And it might be, hey, uh, Golfer X, um, we, 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 we know your game. We've, we've tracked thousands of your shots. There's a new product coming out. We think it's perfect for you. You can go try it here. That's, that's, that's the path forward. Again, we're, we're, not, we're not there yet. Um, so as we, think about, as we think about the consumer experience and data, uh, that, that's the journey we're on. Um, and again, we're really good at the big data collection. Um, we, just, we just have to get better at, 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 at connecting the dots one golfer at a time. Yeah, and many of the panels I went to yesterday, obviously the same point, right? We, we have to know our customer as best we possibly can. They're just used to that now. Right. They're used to getting things right on their phone that are targeted at them. And, and we're behind in that in golf, but we're catching up, and, and I'm biased because uh, I'm a PGA of America member, but I think we're catching up with the help of our members, uh, with the 29,000 that interact with each and every one of you every day at a facility where you may or may not play. It may be at a Top Golf, as I said earlier, but it may be at a golf course. Um, we consider ourselves the business, uh, the experts in the business of the game, and we're also the ones typically coaching you. You, you may be on YouTube and, and following everybody on Instagram, but we're really thrilled about that because you're getting like 30 different takes on your golf swing overnight, and then you're all confused. And then you have to come find one of us to help you navigate all that. So that human factor in the game uh, can't be forgotten when you're thinking about all the data analytics that we're using. But as a coach, um, I use so much more data than I used to use. And Jeff, I want you to talk a little bit about um, the PG of America's build in Frisco, Texas, uh, the headquarters, the world, the home of golf, as we're calling it, and, and how we're going to integrate that kind of data, that kind of uh, tracking opportunity to then reach out to, to all of them. So I'm going to take a step back, Susie, and back to your human point. Um, there's a gentleman in our company by the name of Ted Logan, and he made a statement yesterday. I was on a call, and he said, it's, we've evolved our coaching philosophy, and up until about five years ago, we kind of just treated our members as 29,000. But we now have three career tracks, teaching and coaching being a dedicated track for life. And the great part about golf is you can be on this sport from four to 104. That journey that you can go on is going to be individually exciting and fun for everybody. But I think what we've tried to do in coaching is start with the human, right? How do we engage with the human and understand what their objectives on that journey would be. And they're gonna be very different if you're a win mentality golfer versus a socially oriented golfer versus a mindful golfer who might be about health and wellness and escaping as David was mentioning. Those three mindsets are really important because if we begin with you as a human and understand what motivates you, then the journey that we take you on and our coaches take you on will be one that will be fun for a lifetime. And so we built a model, the American Development Model, which is in partnership with the USOC. Every sport that's in the Olympics needs to have a model by 2025 of how to engage. Because unfortunately, in much of sport, you're seeing young people drop out of sport at a very young age. The average age of Tommy John surgery right now is, I think, 16 years old. That's a scary thought. Young women are dropping out of sports at an alarming rate at age 13. So how do we have as many as possible for as long as possible with as much fun as possible. So that's the framework by which we begin to think about data. What we're doing in Frisco, I think is gonna be transformational with our PGA uh, Coaching Center. And what we're doing, and we're literally in the process of, Susie, I'm very fortunate, Susie's my coach. So she's gotten me from a 16 down to a nine. I've slid back up to a 12 because we haven't, through COVID, had a chance to spend a lot of time together. Not a great PSA. I wasn't around when he went back up to a 12, but okay. <laughs> no, no, it got to 16 to nine. That's the part that was Susie. Um, but ultimately, the journey that each golfer goes on at PJ Frisco will be 
infused by data, but based on the mindset that you're bringing. So as we build out this coaching center, and there's so much data that is available today, but for both the golfer and the coach, it's all kind of dead-ended. Your launch monitor data sits in one place. Force plate data would sit in another place. If you think about tracking of your game on the golf course, that sits in a different place. So what we've asked all of the companies who are participating in our coaching center is, be willing to share the data and let us integrate it and create a dashboard that'll allow the coach to see, hey, Jeff, you're really a social golfer. Let's look at these data facts so you can track how you're doing and your goal is to consistently break 80. So when you're out on the golf course entertaining David or others and doing business, we can meet what your objectives are versus Jordan Spieth, who playing that wonderful title is Pro V1. Correct. He is yep. going to be at the best of his game every time he walks on the golf course. Those are two very different objectives. And so what we're doing in Frisco is taking all of that data and synthesizing it into a dashboard that'll allow our coaches to say, hey, let's focus on what matters to you over the course of your journey. That's never really happened before, Susie, and we have the opportunity with this laboratory that we're creating to really change the way data is made personal for every coach and every golfer on their journey. Totally agree, and I, and I think what's really fascinating to me, having been in the game for what I consider to be a very long time since I was nine, what I see the change in is how we actually speak to people based on based on these data requirements. So for example, I used to ask everybody what they shot. And right? as soon as they finished, I'm like, well, what would you shoot? And you know, not everybody wants to do that. Not everybody cares what they shoot, right? And as soon as that's a huge turn off, and, and these are the types of things that now we're tracking uh, in hopes that we're a, a better industry uh, for our consumers. Right, Susie, if you ask that social golfer, what did you shoot today? They literally turn off and they're intimidated Correct. and they walk away. But if you say, did you have fun today? Hey, what was your best shot? Somebody can always find something there to talk about. And this game is one, everyone loves to talk about it, but we've got to ask them the right questions. Absolutely. You know, we, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the pandemic, for those of you that have suffered from it, you know, certainly no disrespect by this comment, but golf has exploded uh, during the pandemic. And we're not going to go into a pandemic conversation because everybody's worn out on that. However, what it did for us is it offered us the opportunity to reach people who we'd never reached before because they were home more, they wanted some sort of activity outside, they realized golf could be socially responsible, they could play with their family, and they could sneak in three holes, nine holes, 18 holes, and we saw this incredible uptick in the game. So, you know, I'll start with you, David. You know, well, it's really for the whole panel, but knowing that about these record numbers, knowing we're almost at a $90 billion industry now, how do you see that? And, and obviously it's a huge advantage for the manufacturers at this moment in time, but if we look historically at the game, we know there's gonna be a downtrend. How, how are you using data to ensure that this uptick continues or that you level set to understand what you need to do next if we start to see a downward slide? Yeah, so it's a unique time for, for golf manufacturers. Um, you hear supply chain, and we don't want to talk about supply chain, but, but the fact is we make um, most of our golf balls in Massachusetts. We were shut down for three months during the pandemic. We've been playing catch up for the last 18 months. We're still not able to produce at the level we'd like because we can't get enough raw materials. So there's the, the practical business applications. We'd like to run our plants 24-7. We can't, um, again, because we can't get the raw materials. That's happening in, in, in all businesses, uh, you know, as it relates to what's happened to the game. So a staggering number, 90 million more rounds were played in 21 than were played in 19. That's, you know, as a golf ball manufacturer, as a glove manufacturer, as, as a footwear company, those are staggering numbers that really uh, dr drive, drive demand. It, 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 it does also, we're, at, we're often asked the question, how do you think about those new golfers? What's, what's your take on them? And, and the first answer is we love them, right? We love all new golfers. And Susie mentioned in the US alone, there were 800,000 new golfers, fastest growing were juniors, second fastest were women, third fastest were non-Caucasian. So a neat, a neat trend happening within the game of golf that's probably long overdue. Similar storyline outside the U.S. About half of the industry and game is played in the U.S., the other half outside the U.S. So the same dynamic and growth is happening outside the U.S. We also all understand that, hey, life's going to change on us here in the next year or two as we evolve to a new normal out of the pandemic or into um, the endemic, if you will. And folks may have less time, therefore they may, may play less golf. So we're all trying to figure out where does it land 
because it drives forecasting and business planning and so forth. Um, and, and then maybe, Susie, to the thought of how, to, how does a company like mine think about new golfers, and this is more about business logic and discipline than it is about data, but it's often married. Um, in the golf business, historically, about 15% of the players played 40% of the rounds and spent 70% of the dollars. Um, so, so our focus as a company, while we love all golfers, we focus on the avids, the dedicated, those who say, hey, I'm, I'm in it, I'm going to try to get better, and I believe performance equipment will help me get better. That, that's our audience. <laughs> So you, you're asked the question, what about a new golfer? Well, that's not our priority, but we do have avenues to engage with them. We have a recycle, we have the largest recycled golf ball business um, in, in, in the world. We have um, some of our consumable categories. We get you earlier in the, in the food chain than, than we may in our, our club categories. So we're very thoughtful in terms of how we stay true to our focus um, on our core audience. But, but also mindful that, hey, there's a, there's a new wave of participant coming in, um, and we need to think about how we connect with them and how we uh, at least educate them about our aspirational brands. So it's a, it's a really a fascinating time in golf because uh, I, I've, been, I've been with, with Akushnet for over 30 years. Um, you know, for, for, the first, for, the, for the first 29, it was about assessing demand. And, and for the last two, it's all been about um, propping up supply, and it's just a changing time, and the whole industry feels that. The whole industry is going through that right now. Um, but it is a very dynamic time, and, and Susie, you're right. We're all thinking about, uh, for an industry that's, that's um, been on such a run for the last couple of years, the general sentiment, it's going to be really strong in a year or two, but it may not be at this peak level that we're seeing today. Uh, now that said, we got an earnings call a year ago and said rounds of play in 21. We took a big leap forward in 20, in, in 20 from 19. They're going to be down, but we were wrong because golfers just kept playing and kept playing. So it's a really important um, metric to understand because it drives in many respects. For me, it drives manufacturing and business planning for the PG of America, it drives labor. It drives how much you're going to spend on, on uh, golf course maintenance and so on and so forth. Um, but, but again, that's, that's, the, that's the, 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 the world of, of golf manufacturers today. And it's a great place to, to be because it's born of this heightened demand we're seeing. You know, let's hop into some of the technology points of the game. And Ken, I'm going to kind of throw this at you to start. Can you explain ShotLink to us? Uh, just as a group in case people aren't familiar with what it is and the rebuilding of that. But also we had a great conversation about you tracking 14 golf balls in the air all at the same time. You know, what are you really looking at from a technology aspect, not just in ShotLink, but, but how are you dealing with that? Are you going to start using AI? What do you use the ShotLink data for? Um, and how does that affect the fan or the viewer? Ooh, um. That's a lot of places to start. So um, <laughs> it actually, so I'm just going to start with uh, kind of what Dave was talking about here for a second. I think that the single best way that we as the tour can help to continue this growth is to basically measure as much as we possibly can. So I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a great L, uh, college, uh, women's college golf event that happened this week that was on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday that was awesome. It was great. And it was measured and scored, but it didn't have any kind of data other than that around it. We need to find a way to make ShotLink a simpler faster and cheaper solutions so that we can measure more of that stuff. Because at that point, the more data you have about that data is the exhaust that kind of turns the turbine of, of interest. And if you have that, then you've got that. You, you can make what you want. You can get people to stay interested. So we are working first off on some solutions to get to do that. In addition, so just to, to answer your question about ShotLink, and I'm going to do this. I'll do this really, really fast. And I apologize to people that have heard this before. And also, I get really jazzed about this. And when I get jazzed, I talk fast. So, But um, just <clears throat> kind of a, a quick rundown on what ShotLink is and where it came from. ShotLink's 20 years old. Um, it was one of the, it was, it, was a, it was a difficult problem to solve. Basically, think about it. You're trying to measure everything that happens on 200 acres on a new, new playing field every week. We are literally the circus. We come to town, we put up a tent, we do a show, and we leave. Um, and we, it's, it's a very much a you can't. And by the way, golf courses aren't real happy when you, you know, leave divots. Think about giant trucks. So um, 
What we do right now on a weekly basis, this is what, what Shotlink's objective or the way that we do it. It's between five and seven trucks that we move on a weekly basis inside the U.S., depending on where you want to go. We show up, um, it's a 10-day build. Uh, it's 11 if you count the, the strike and we're out in the next, and we leapfrog week to week. What we put down is we, we drop, it's on between 150 and 250 acres, depending on the golf course. That's a very broad numbers, but just gives you an idea of scope. Um, we don't have a single playing field. I envy any of you that are following one ball at a given time, and I mean no disrespect because they're good and bad sports broadcasts, but if you point one camera at the ball on a football field, you will know who won the game. Um, I do not have that luxury. So we have, to, we have 18 holes, and not just that, but there are, and in, on a Thursday or Friday, there are 144 people hitting a ball. Which one mattered? Which one was the good one? Which story was the fun one? It, it, there is no chaos that is as interesting to me as a TV truck on a Thursday afternoon. Um, those guys are trying to figure out how to tell a good story. All of this, by the way, is built to tell, tell stories. So the way that we handle that is that we roll in, we drop between 15 and 25 miles of fiber on the golf course, at, um, and that puts us down a network. We run the network in three whole loops. It's redundant, fully redundant, because we cannot have anything go down. We have a seven second global SLA to deliver data everywhere in the, in the world. From there, we have to know everything about that ball, where it went, what it did, how, who hit it, wh how it got there. That um, fiber we put down includes four strands of fiber, two strands of copper, because we have to power all the sensor devices that are on the golf course. At that point, we put between 55 and 65 D marks on the golf course. Each of those has uh, dual uh, VLAN switches in them so that we can run those and whisper generators. All that runs a set of sensors that include uh, handheld devices, uh, iPad, like you know, tablets. That also includes radar, cameras, and lasers. Every one of those things is built so that every single time a golf ball is hit, it relates to every other shot that's hit. And all of the information that comes in um, moves in a dynamic way. So every scoreboard that's on the golf course, oh, by the way, we also put out 11 scoreboards, we mount those, we power those, and we dynamically program them. So when a golfer shows up and hits a ball, on that scoreboard it'll say, this guy just hit a ball. Here's some cool stuff about him. This is why you care about the next shot they're gonna hit, yada, yada, yada. So all that's awesome. Um, takes about 120 people plus 35 staff members to make go. There's a giant set of networking that goes on. Oh, we also put a private Wi-Fi network on top of that and a private LTE cellular network on top of that so that inside the golf course there is no such thing as not having connectivity. And if there is, we will know about it and we will fix it right away. That doesn't include everything that happens with the backhaul or the month in advance uh, drone mapping that we're doing down to the point cloud level that I mentioned earlier. So we're using photogrammetry, point cloud data to try and pull off, not try, we literally map the golf course down to the leaf. So that's sort of how ShotLink works today. Um, the trick is we are now taking that, ripping it out and starting over from scratch um, because at sometimes you got to start from, you got to start the code base over like at some points it's just worth it to rip and replace and so we are looking at that from an opportunity standpoint because not only do we want to look at that from a tech standpoint the sensors here are super cool um, one of the things that we just did as an aside we just um, rolled out we are now putting radar not only on every tee but on every green so you'll have not just outbound but inbound shot data this means that you won't just have tracing outbound, you will actually have dynamic tracing on inbound shots so that when, that when you see somebody rip the ball around a tree, you will see that trace. But it's not just the trace, it's the data about the trace. So within two seconds of that ball leaving a club face, we will know spin rate, axis of rotation, because that, those sensors can measure not just the ball, which is insane, you're literally tracking something the size of a golf ball, but also the edges of the ball to know how fast each edge of the ball was moving and at what level. So that gives us the ability to then model that data and come up with interesting facts about it and predict where the ball is going to go and what it's going to do. The thing that we're working on next is we are working on ways to reduce the time of that build, uh, be able to move that build globally wherever we want it to go as fast as we possibly can. Um, I've made some unreasonable demands of my team. We'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> Um, but also reduce the number of people it takes to operate and increase so that we have ball in motion T2 green on every golf course. And I talked about that a few minutes ago. And then on top of that, not just, that's what we refer to as big shot length. That's everything, that's all the bells and whistles. But in addition, by the way, there's also a huge telecom problem there. So that we're working on everything from sub six to mid band to C band to millimeter wave solutions um, and talking to people that own that spectrum so that we can work with them on what is on the golf course so that we can get that data out as fast as possible. And then there's the backhaul. Um, and how you take that. And we have doubled the amount of data we're moving off the golf course now, and then we are going to triple and probably quadruple that in the next two years, because video is just data, guys. So every single one of those radar units has two cameras built into it. That means that we're gonna get to a point where we can track and watch every shot. We did an experiment last year at Players where we called, we're really good with brand names, every shot live, because we saw every shot live, right? Um, it's very descriptive. 
we are working on getting that to the point where we can do that everywhere and then give you tools to be able to play with that information. Tourcast is great fun. If you have not played with it, it's really cool. It basically gives you a video game interface where you can stick yourself at any point and watch what happened. And, and we're adding data to that as quickly as we can and make it reliable. Um, again, when you're working on 200 acres, reliability is a real, that's a, that's a challenge. So the, the other piece that we're working on is taking all of that and then putting it into um, a smaller package. I refer to it affectionately as Shutlink Lite, or we've called it Shutlink in a suitcase, and a way that we can make that smaller, cheaper, and faster so that we can put it into more forums and basically just create more and more data. Sorry, that was a lot. There's a test after. <laughs> as you walk out. I think what's so fascinating about that is when you sit there and, and talk to Ken, like golf is just so much more than just hitting the ball now, at least the way we're looking at it, um, which makes it cool for everybody. Even if you don't play the game, you can come into the game, be a fan, and be able to be energized by what Ken's building and, and what they're doing on the tour. Um, and then, of course, that's going to feed into gambling. It's going to feed into manufacturing, what kind of golf ball you want to play, what the spin loft is, what's happening with that spin axis, which then helps us as coaches determine what ball to put you in. Uh, the more data we have from the tour, the more we know where our top-level mark is, and people always want to be compared to that. They always, well, what's a tour player do from there? What's an LPGA tour player do from there? And then making shot link cheaper and faster gives the opportunity for women's sports to have a tracking mechanism. Well, they have the very first statistics coming out from the KPMG uh, analytics study. Um, but think about that. 2022 is the first time the LPGA has any statistical tracking going on, which is a sad testament to women's sports. Um, but we're fixing it. We're going to do it with Ken's help. We're going to do it with ShotLink because those female athletes deserve the absolute best tracking um, so they can perform at the highest level of the game alongside the men. Well, just, just one thing, Susie, mm -hmm. on that. I think I just, just to, to kind of finish out that entire thought is that I look at data as the ultimate storytelling tool. That's, that's the fuel you use to make those stories. We actually have two of those. So there's all the data that we just basically are providing a pipe of information. There's a whole other set of people that are taking that and making it into something interesting. So what is the story you care about? And we're, we're actually working on things to say, what are the thing that you should care about that you don't know that you would care about, but you want to before you knew it, right? We are literally working on those kind of predictive ideas to say, a cool shot is about to happen. You should look over here. And by the way, it's a cool shot because your dad likes this guy. You should text him. You know, like something along those lines where you get into that level of depth to get predictive because we know about you, but we also know when something interesting is going to happen. At the tour, there's a second half to that, which is there's a whole team called literally the storytelling team. And their job is to take that and add the human element of it. Because as we talked about earlier, it comes down to people, right? Individuals and sports for all of this cool stuff and optimizing performance and all things comes down to a good story, right? It is a fun thing to watch someone do something that's really hard and do it really well, which is why we do this. Susie, if I could, I want to say thank you to Ken because on a number of levels, what the tour does, golf has probably never been more collaborative than it is today in terms of the organizations and manufacturers working together for the good of the game, the good of the industry. Um, we're fortunate that the Ryder Cup and the PGA Championship are powered by ShotLink and we're able to use that data. But I'll tell a little story related to the Ryder Cup because it was great to have ShotLink at the Ryder Cup, but our team, Scouts Analytics, Jason Aquino and his team working with the first real money ball captain in Steve Stricker, all of that data from ShotLink over the course of the year really helped to frame the, the way the team was put together, ultimately how the team was matched, and the ability to use that data to allow the players to have the greatest success, to put them in the position to win, was very much a, an output of what ShotLink was doing, tracking those players over the course of two seasons. And so thank you for working with us in the championship and the Ryder Cup, but also for powering kind of how the Ryder Cup team came together. And obviously that 19 to nine win for us was, uh, was a big one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, and I, I don't know if that's news to all of you, but every single thing, including pairings, is tracked uh, by data now and statistics for the Ryder Cup. Uh, it's, I think, part of the reason we're far more successful than we have in the past, but the human side to that is where the captain comes in to determine whether well, they going to ignore the statistics of who should be playing together, who's the best at foursomes, who should tee up the ball first, uh, who's the best in four ball, who should play, even if they're best player in the world. Should we play in 36 holes, 18 holes? all tracked now. Every single part of that's tracked based on performance of all of them. Uh, so we have the best chance of keeping the Ryder Cup here. Um, sadly, uh, the European side does the same thing. So <laughs> we try very hard to do it a little bit better, but it's thanks to ShotLink and our partners 
um, that's making us have insights that weren't thought about in the past, inclusive of types of grass, what players best on which types of grass, what players best in what types of conditions. Um, all that is now tracked 24-7 uh, from tour players um, so that we can have the, the greatest advantage. Um, David, you know, thinking about technology, thinking about everything we just talked about, how it's going to put which club in your hand based on all these trends and the data, um, what innovative technology do you feel is in the future uh, for the game from your perspective uh, based on some of this data, data that we're collecting? Yeah, I, I, I sort of teased it earlier, and, and I'll, 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 the custom fitting piece, right? It, it, the holy grail for our industry is to know more about every individual golfer and better connect and align our products and services with that individual golfer. That goes to product development, customization. It goes to how we communicate, right? We've all seen this. We used to, back in the day, we'd run television commercials, right? And that was it, and we'd hope you'd watch them. Um, now, through interactions, we do, we do, um, and, 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 and the whole e-commerce game is part of our story, but what's interesting about e-commerce is um, we're, we're involved with about 50,000 live chats a year just in the U.S., and it's, it's, we're just getting started on this, so, so 50,000 connection points that are new. What do we do with that, right? That's a great tool. That's a great set of data that we can begin to leverage and, 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 and work from. So that's, that's a part of, of, of the story. The, the other side of, of the e-commerce piece is it just gives you real-time information and forecasting what's hot, what's not. It surprises a lot of folks to know that about 2% of the, of the people who come to our websites buy things. Um, and lo and behold, that's a good number. That's a really good number. Um, so what that tells me is 98% come looking for information to go buy somewhere else. And that's really important to us because we live both in the wholesale and the and 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 and, and the e-commerce space, far more notably in, in the wholesale in the wholesale space. So, there's the whole improving the golfer experience. At the end of the day, we just want you to have great experiences with our products, and we know the more we customize it and tailor it to you, the better off we're going to be. So that's that's the long-term aspiration. Uh, we, we've been on it for a long time, but again, new data, new information keeps coming at us, and we keep finding new ways to use it. The other side of it um, is at our core, we're a manufacturer and we're a, um, you know, it, 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 uh, I'll take a quick second. Um, Titleist Golf Ball Business was founded by two MIT classmates. Uh, best I can tell, they graduated in about 1907, 1908. They founded Titleist in 1932. The first ball came out in 1935. These were engineers and chemists who happened to be avid golfers. So. Uh, there's a patent I shared with, with Jan and Susie from 1936. It's a remarkable invention they made to just test products, right? Absent all the technologies of today to test and collect data. And, and that's sort of the, the heart and core of our organization is, um, is we call it precision manufacturing. So outside of the consumer experiences, what can data, what can information do for us as a, as a leading performance manufacturer? Um, most important to us is to make the best stuff. Uh, also important to us, equally important to us, is to make the most consistent stuff, whether it's balls, clubs, footwear, uh, apparel, and so on and so forth. So when I think about where we go in the future, um, data analytics are having a remarkable effect on our ability to, again, what we call precision manufacture products. We're just getting better. The tolerance or, or tolerances are getting tighter and tighter, and you're getting a much more consistent product. So there's the, the manufacturing side of the, of the equation. The consumer side I've touched on, it's better customization, and, it, and it's really much more focused, tailored communication to you. So we're only sharing with you information that you care about, as opposed to, again, 20, 30 years ago, we put the big ad out and hope you liked it. Um, and, and, and I'll, I'll take a second to talk about the analytics piece, because, um, you know, as a... As, as premium brands, um, supply and demand is an important part of the, the, the discussion, right? You put too much product in the market, you got a problem because you have to net it down, discount it, and, and, and blow it out, and suddenly you're not a premium brand anymore. So every company's trying to hit the supply-demand curve right on the button. We have a, we have a, a, a putter business, Scotty Cameron. It's, it's, we think, the leading putter franchise in the world. It's just a cool business to begin with. Um, you know, the goal of that business is to assess demand, 
and put supply just below it, right? Not so easy, but that's how we think about it. And again, the more, we, the more data we pull in, the more we understand how to go about that, the better able we are to achieve it. So that's not, um, that's not something we, we, we sing from the heavens, but it's a very important part of what we do behind the scenes to manage and control and, 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 and position our brands in the marketplace. We have about five minutes left before we're going to do a little Q&A, and, and this one's for Ken and, and probably Jeff, um, certainly David, chime in too um, in that little amount of time we have. But, you know, the media entertainment industry, as we all are well aware, has gone to so much digital streaming uh, versus a, a cable box. I'm of the age that I still have both. I have a cable box in my house, which Jen laughs at me about. Um, but, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, what you see as a fan viewing experience as we move forward because, you know, Ken, you and I had a really com cool conversation about AI and pointing your phone anywhere on the golf course. Can you elaborate on that? If I'm sitting there watching, I'm on site at an event, what, what you're thinking? Yeah, well, so let me just start but before you even get to the event because unfortunately, seriously, unfortunately, most people can't get there and you, I, I, I'm not just blowing smoke. You should go to a PGA Tour event. It's a lot different than what you think it is. It is a great deal of fun. But before then, you're just at your house or you're in, with your friends or wherever you are. Um, so just take, take Tourcast, for example. That right now is a place where you start and you can watch what happens and you see the ball and you see the data and you see what's going on and things move through holes. That is the first step toward you building a broadcast that you would own yourself. Because if you think about it, you take that immediate product and we're working on ways to do this now where I could theoretically layer multiple players simultaneously across that. If they started in actual real time earlier than the players that are playing now, I could do that. I could watch them and I could say, I only care about these five guys for whatever reason that might be, and I can see how they play on every hole as if they were in one group. I've now, I've now created a broadcast. It's a digital video gaming, but you know what? Video pops up in some of those cases where it's available, right? That's the beginnings of you. We think of a curated broadcast because Tommy Roy, very good at his job and is doing that for NBC. But you, by the way, have a preference. So let's give you the tools and make you and, and help you do that. That's one way that we're doing that. The other is, as we continue to solve the telecom problems on the golf course, Half of the, the challenge is I'm looking at people on a playing field that is hundreds sometimes of yards long, and I can't tell who even just hit the ball. So um, in a current world, if I could just hold my phone up and first off, <laughs> let me just identify who those people are. Oh, that's the guy I actually cared about. That's cool. We're pretty close to that now. Um, but then I want to be able to trace in real time so I can see the ball, even though, I mean, a little white ball on a giant, you know, blue sky is something that's really hard to find. You can't see where it went. I lost it is something you hear a lot when you're standing in a gallery. Well, I want to be able to just be able to pull that back. Take that one step further and start showing me zones where other players have impacted. Start showing where other players have hit the ball or what other people have done. Start making it so that the gamification, golf is an amazing sport to watch because you really have two options if you're at a golf tournament. On the one hand, you can either sit at one super cool place and just watch everybody go by, or you can find somebody you really like, and literally, if they're the right person, this is not a Tiger Woods kind of phenomenon, but if they're a different kind of player, you can if you get to the like some of the holes on the on the backside. It's you and that guy. You can have a conversation. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying you could, right? But and and you're you're that close to the action. Well, in that case, you can learn a whole lot more about that person if there's more interesting things. You get you choose different people to follow because you know more about them, and that's presented to you in a way that is predictive so that you understand the things. We know what you have liked and we know what you were probably gonna like. How can we put that in front of you in more and more interesting ways? And that, by the way, is really hard. I just defined like six different use cases and in one app, that's a really difficult thing to do, right? Are you at home? Or are you at the golf course? We, we now know that and we customize for that. But even then, where are you on the golf course? What are you looking at? Who were the other people you liked? Were you willing to share that with us? I understand why you wouldn't, but it really would help you if you did. Will you please all just share that with us so that we would know? You know, that level of data and what you do with that is, is kind of where we're headed, so. And Susie, I would just say, um, when we did our deal with CBS and ESPN for the PGA Championship, ESPN Plus was a big part of that, and we did that deal in 2017, kind of at the front edge of what ESPN Plus has become. And it's amazing to work with the great team at ESPN to think about how we unlock the value at a major championship of what else can be shown. Amazing linear feed on ESPN, great coverage, great coverage by CBS. But on Thursday and Friday, as, as you're saying, major championship, you know, imagine someday if a Manning cast-like activity were happening, or a, a wagering channel was available for those who care about wagering. All of a sudden, we can give our viewers, and we may have 40,000 people on site, but four, five, six million on a Thursday or Friday afternoon, hopefully we can make that 10 million, because we're creating opportunities for folks to engage 
on the way they want to engage rather than it just being programmed for you. So everything Ken said, but we really appreciate how ESPN has helped us to broaden the way we can bring major championship golf to fans. Well, just to, just to add one thing to that too. So the ESPN, we, so this year, same, exactly the same thing. The PGA Tour went to ESPN Plus for our streaming, but we didn't just go there. We added four different feeds. So keep in mind, we still have a lot of holes where you can't watch golf. We're not on all of them yet. And it's not because we don't want to, it's just hard. It really is just a challenge. We're gonna get there, chill, but we're, it's hard. Um, but because of that, we, PGA Tour Entertainment actually is producing the broadcast now in conjunction with ESPN, but the thing that we have really embraced this year, and if you, I, I really encourage you to take a look at it, you're going to see all kinds of stuff floating on that screen, some of which, by the way, is terrible, and some of which is really awesome, and what you're seeing is that their cool stuff is showing up now in other broadcasts and getting picked up. The tour has one advantage. We do it every single week, and reps matter in this. It's, it's, it's hard, but it also is good because it allows us to then feed, and, and we see that ecosystem grow over time. So we're really trying to embrace experimenting with things like that. So thank you, because you sent in a ton of questions, and I apologize if we don't get to yours, but we'll have these gentlemen stay a little bit after. So if I don't get to your questions, I apologize. Just come on up, and, and we'll try to answer them all for you. Um, so thank you for submitting them. But the first one's for you, Jeff. We've heard the PGA of America term the new Frisco facility, the Silicon Valley of golf. What is the PGA's vision for the future of data in golf, and how does the PGA plan to understand further who their new growing audience is? Well, tremendous question. Let me try and break that down. I did talk about the way we want to integrate data for coaches and for players and so that everyone is getting the data that's important to them, and it's a unified approach. So I think that's the first level of what we want to do. Second, I'm gonna to point to Fahad, who's joined us recently as our head of brand and digital marketing. One of the things that I think is so important about the future versus 20 years ago, talking about how do we sustain this, we all grow databases of golfers and we understand who they are and we're able to communicate them. So rather than 20 years ago when Tiger came, there was no real way to open the door to a lot of golfers. So there was a challenge that we weren't, golf has been tough, it can be intimidating. So part of what we're trying to do at Frisco is break all those barriers down. We're creating an environment that is going to be welcoming to everyone, and there'll be two great championship golf courses that will host all of our championships and, and be amazing. But I think it's the idea of this laboratory where it begins with fun and enjoyment and engagement, and then we take you on that journey and use data to help get you to where you want to be. But ultimately, that is the laboratory. We're not going to solve everything the day that the doors open next April. But over the course of the next 10 years, it is our ability to work with titleists and others to make sure we understand how we create better experiences for golfers through a journey with a PGA professional. I can't, that is ultimately our mission is to serve our members and to help to grow the game. We believe the best way to go on a journey in life is with the, the, the friendship, the camaraderie, and ultimately the relationship building with a PGA coach. And that's for everybody, and we want to make sure everyone understands that it's not just for the best players in the world, everybody finding a coach and engaging is the opportunity that we have. Yeah, when you're talking about gaining new customers, you know, you think about Frisco Jeff, talk a little bit about the Himalaya, Himalaya putting green yeah. and where it's positioned based on retail so that we can capture So that. again, 75,000 square foot putting experience, lighted, as I said, not just sun up to sundown, but we can go there till one in the morning it is literally brought right into our PGA District experience. So our coaching center, retail, a, a, an ice house, a lounge for sports bar, we've got so much there. Um, a huge video board that will have golf events, sporting events, we'll have entertainment. We are trying to make sure, Jimmy Terry, our GM, tells the story of a young girl and, and her mom coming to get an ice cream cone. And she sees people on that putting experience put a putter in her hand, she goes to the Frisco High School, which is gonna be practicing at our facility. She ultimately goes to our coaching center, earns a scholarship to the University of Texas, and comes back to play in the KPMG Women's PGA Championship. That journey will happen, and the opportunity to invite everybody to play the game is what Frisco is all about. Thanks, Jeff. Ken, the next one's for you. How have insights produced with ShotLink data changed not only how PGA Tour players play the game, but also how amateurs play? It's a great question. Um, yeah, because I can go on and at length about the tour players, but the amateurs, I think maybe some of these other guys might be better, might be better positioned to talk to. It's, I mean, the, the biggest single thing that I can, that I can say is that it, it helps you understand uh, 
the distance between your game and theirs and the distance between your game and theirs. And the example I will give is two days ago, on, on Thursday, John Rahm, who was the number one player in the world, missed a 10-inch putt. He lost .9999 strokes on that putt. In other words, he lost a stroke because it was really bad. And yet, that's a thing that happens all the time. And it's identified both how good and how, frankly, bad the sometimes tour players are. The most interesting thing that you see them do is recover. And I think that's what I've seen uh, amateurs work on a lot is how they recover from difficult situations. And it's entertaining. It's interesting and entertaining, but also a teachable moment. How do you get out of that kind of level of trouble? I don't know, you guys may have more to add. I, mean, I think I can add to it too from a coaching perspective. So what ShotLink has done is it's had given opportunity and capitalization opportunity to people like you who have built apps for the consumer to help them have strokes gained capabilities on their own game and what they're putting into that data. So there's birdie, 18 birdies, birdie fire, game forge, uh, decade golf who spoke here yesterday. Multiple companies are helping you digest that as a consumer uh, for your game where you can still see the data from the tour game, but you can compare. So if you're at a certain level in your game, what are the trends I need to uh, escalate in my game? What are the things where I'm losing the most strokes per round for where my goal is? And how can I establish a new metric for that based on the data that I'm putting in? And, and that's all come out of statistics from ShotLink. Mm -hmm. Uh, do we have time for, yeah, we probably have time for a couple more. Um, this is like my favorite question ever, so whoever asked it, uh, if you want to chat, let's do it after uh, two. But do you think sports specialization at increasingly young ages is hurting young people in golf, uh, people dropping out of the sport? And I'm going to throw that to Jeff. The number one component of ADM is develop the whole athlete. We believe that sports specialization at a young age is literally driving people away from sport. This, that's not just a belief, that's the data. If you look at the data, the dropout rates, when kids specialize, they just get burned out. So we want to see the whole athlete develop, and that athlete has an opportunity then to become a great golfer. So we fundamentally believe that multiple sports, in fact, the way the ADM model has been put into golf, when we're working with young kids, and Susie's doing her junior league program, they may be kicking a soccer ball to develop balance or they may be dribbling a basketball. But ultimately, we believe that if you develop the whole athlete, they're gonna have a journey of a lifetime as a golfer. If they specialize too early before the age of 14, the likelihood is they're gonna drop out and never play again. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, David, I'm gonna throw this one at you. Um, what are your thoughts on the gamification of golf and how can brands take advantage of it to bring in consumers who may or may not use your products? Yeah, so, so that's, um, everybody's thinking about gamification. Uh, I will say it's, it's a step or two outside of our core focus, but if it, if it invites you uh, to learn more about our brands, then we're, we're certainly gonna, gonna pay attention to it. Um, again, as a, as a equipment manufacturer, um, we're all trying to understand, and all equipment manufacturers are trying to understand what's the linkage, right? What's the linkage to, uh, to gambling? What's the, what's the linkage to video games? And to what extent does it influence perception and trial and ultimately purchase of your products? And, and really, that's, a, that's for the consumer to decide. And, and for some consumers, there's a linkage. And for others, there may not be. So, uh, Susie, it, it really is a... a, a a topic we're given a whole lot of thought to. We, we haven't landed on any any path forward, but more than anything, like like all roads roads in most companies, you just always have to go back to the consumer and say, what do they think? What what, what do they make of this? And you try to stay a, a step or two in front of it. But um, but as an equipment manufacturer, gamification, um, the gambling piece, the video game component, um, it's 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 in our ecosystem. It's not right on top of us, but it's a linkage between us and consumers. Therefore, we pay close attention to it. 20 seconds or less for the three of you. What are you most excited about? Start with me? Mm -hmm. Shot link. Yeah, I, mean, right? <laughs> I mean, there's some freaky cool stuff coming that we're going to do. So I'm excited about the way that we're going to measure stuff on the ball. Like, they, well, not the ball, but just the game as a whole. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, we have, um, we have a, 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 an R&D team uh, on balls alone of 75 people uh, downstairs in New Bedford, Massachusetts. They're brilliant. Uh, I could say the same about clubs and other parts. I'm, I'm just excited about what they create. We have the industry leading patent portfolio. Patents are a big deal in golf, a surprisingly big deal in golf. Uh, that patent portfolio helps me sleep at night because it drives innovation for the future. Jeff? I'm excited to welcome PGA professionals to PGA Frisco. 
beginning in April and having them come home. I'm excited about all of you playing more golf. Thanks for being here. <laughs>